All right, it says that we are live. Should we wait a little while to see, um, I guess, to get viewers? If anyone tunes in on a Friday. To see if anyone tunes in. Fridays are for margaritas, but here we are being nerds. <laughs> Chrissy, what she's the cool one. She didn't even tell us. She didn't send that memo. Well, see, this tells me that you don't know me. Because if you've met me for more than 10 minutes, you would have expected that. Right, Deshane? <laughs> aye, aye, aye. Is anyone there? I thought I was like um, doing well by wearing my blue top, but the Shane just comes in here and like outshine me with her wall. She's like, I have a wall that is blue. <laughs> but you know what, the Shane? I have a mug that is blue, so. So we had a blue room, right? And I saw a parent posted their blue room. And I was like, our room was totally blue first, and now it's just one accent wall. And I was like, man, we don't have a blue wall. We don't have a blue room anymore, but that looks so cool. <laughs> <laughs> they had to have it. Yeah. Nice. I've gotten so many questions over the month about, like, why blue? Like, well, calming, it's universal, you use for autism. But it was like, so it's not political. I go, yeah. no, 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 no. Anywhere around the world, buildings all over the world lighted up blue for autism. This was not a, oh, let me pick my favorite color sort of thing. Um, which, you know, if I probably would have had to choose, it probably wouldn't have been blue because I am now officially like out of blue clothes. Because at first we said, every time we go on the video, we do these things, we're going to make sure we wear blue. And then um, yesterday we were filming something and we're like, yeah, I got no more blue. <laughs> <laughs> Note to self, next year, April, buy blue clothes. <laughs> yeah, I found out I have like two or three blue tops. And I can't wear one of them to work. So it's like. One of my moms said that. She's like, I have blue clothes. They're just not appropriate for what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> hmm. Okay. Um we have a few viewers now. I suppose we can begin. There we go. Hi, good night, everyone. I am Zahira Lozano uh, from Orange Walk Town. I am a mental health advocate and an aspiring psychologist. I have a degree from the Universidad Anahuac Mayab in Merida, Mexico. And uh, I am a, tonight I am representing the Heritage Education Network. Please. I am your hostess for tonight, and tonight's topic is autism spectrum disorder um, in Belize, particularly. Heritage Education Network for those who are first-time viewers and first-time joiners is a team of people who are dedicated to art and culture, promoting art and culture in Belize and basically heritage. So why would we have mental health the question is why not you know heritage culture and education it is involved with everything especially our mental health the way we were raised the way our mind has been cultivated throughout the years depends has been based a lot on our um, heritage and our culture and beliefs so let's discuss autism and beliefs tonight's guests are miss christy castillo a uh, super autism mom and Mrs. Deshane Lopez. So if you ladies would like to introduce yourselves. Deshane, you're the expert. You go first. <laughs> <laughs> you're also an expert mom. So hi, everyone. My name is Deshane Lopez. I am a registered clinical psychologist. I'm part of my specialty is doing assessments for persons with autism, learning disabilities, ADHD, and other neurodevelopmental disorders. I am the clinical, I'm a clinical psychologist at Counseling and Psychological Services. Hi everyone, I'm Christy Castillo Almeida. I am the founder and the chair of 
autism Belize. As they mentioned before, I'm an autism mom, which means I stumble and fail a lot, but I keep going. That's probably the only definition that makes us super is that we keep going even with all the challenges that are ahead of us. I have a wonderfully hyperactive, hates sleep, loves water, manages to break just about every iPad he's ever owned, 13 year old son who is on the autism spectrum. Uh, he is nonverbal, but communicates through his iPad and severely autistic, but pretty cool dude. Okay, um, that's it for intros, check. Um, let's begin, what is autism? People joining us tonight, some may know, some may not know. So what, what is autism and what is the autism spectrum disorder? Let's look at our second side of the presentation. <laughs> um let's see here. Okay, there we go. So to begin with, let's start with some facts. These little green check marks here because these are all facts. The autism spectrum disorder is a neurodevelopmental disorder. I know that can be a very big and confusing word, or it can be pretty straightforward. It literally means neuro of the brain. Um, developmental, it develops which an uh, individual's growth and development. Um, and it is considered a disorder, although that is also, um, that could be argued by many. It's, it, it's up to everyone's discretion, I suppose. But for the sake of psychology and the DSM-5 tonight, autism spectrum disorder. It is considered a disorder and approximately 1% and increasing of the population is, is affected by um, autism. And as you can see my little drawing down there, um, my images, I'm sorry, five, to every five boys, one girl is diagnosed. Now, there's many questions that arise here. Does that mean it has something to do with our genes? Are, guys, are boys more prone to autism? Or is it like, is it the case with um, similar to ADD or ADHD in which normally girls are diagnosed um, differently or they're affected differently and we don't know enough about it to identify it as yet. Uh, we, this, one more thing, going back to neurodevelopmental, it's important to know that a child is born with autism. So this begins from the moment you are in your mama's womb. It's not something that you acquire. So we can go to the next slide. We'll see that it is um, the cause is unknown. It is individualistic in the sense that no two individuals with autism are affected by autism in the same way. Just like me and Kristen are not the same person, just like I have water in my cup and she has margaritas, children and people on the spectrum are all different. They all have their particular set of characteristics and symptoms. And so um, you have to respect that in them as well. You can't expect like every child with autism to be the same. Like, and that's what makes it also difficult to diagnose many times because it is so diverse. It is called a spectrum because of the diversity of symptoms and um, signs of the disorder. So it was originally identified in 1908 and it wasn't called autism then. It was just known as something because we didn't under there was no name for it. They didn't understand it, and we still don't fully understand what it is completely. Um, it was just classified as a type of schizophrenia in which an individual prefers to be isolated and alone. Um, 
the characteristic combination for every person with autism is different. And it, it is called a spectrum again because of the wide variety and the diversity of symptoms that can affect an individual on the spectrum. There is no known cure, quote unquote, for autism. Many people will tell you that there doesn't need to be a cure. And I agree, there doesn't need to be a cure for a different type of thinking or brain structure. But it's also important to know that this world wasn't necessarily designed for people on the spectrum. Because they are a minority, the world has been designed differently, not for people who are atypical, but for neurotypical individuals, which can make things very difficult, especially if you're growing up on the spectrum in Belize. So imagine if 1% of the population around the world how many individuals in Belize are affected and how many individuals in Belize have been diagnosed? Because many times these people just go off as, oh, he's just like the weird person from the village or yeah, he just like he banned different, you know? But no one really looks into, well, not commonly do people look into disorders of this type. And many times it's because we're not aware that these things exist and that they can thrive given the right resources. Um, it is also considered a continuum because you don't necessarily get diagnosed with a type of on the spectrum with type one or two or three and you have to stay there. Many times with the help of therapy and um, different therapists, this isn't something that Christy will be able to tell us a lot more on that, Listen to something that you go to one person and that person will be it to fix everything. No, this is something in which it, it really takes a community to help a child with autism thrive many times. And uh, you can either advance or you can have regressions while on the spectrum. And again, it all depends on the type of resources the individual has access to. And the um, tip of my tongue, guys, consistency, the consistency <laughs> of attending to therapy and getting all these resources in. If we go to the next slide. So autism is primarily categorized by affecting the following areas of an individual. Social interaction challenges, cognitive dysfunction, repetitive behaviors. So social, many times these people prefer to be alone. Many, I say many, but most, <laughs> majority. I have, I have worked with children on the spectrum and I also have a very close friend of mine who is on the spectrum. And he is a magnificent individual, just like the children that I have met. But every individual has been different. The children would prefer to be alone. Didn't even want Simi, because they see me and they're like terribly, ugh, work. Um, they don't want to socialize. My friend was the same. Like he never want he's not all about that um super social gathering. He prefers a very small group if we're going to socialize. Um why? Many times also because of... Am I allowed to interrupt? <laughs> well, there's a I first time for everything. For a lot of the kids is a fallacy. I think that they appear to want to be alone because we are trying to get them to enter into our worlds instead of us trying to go into theirs. I'm just going to put I, that up. Yeah. yeah again, I guess because the, the, like I said, the world, this world really isn't very friendly for them. This world and this country and community can many times be just terrifying or discouraging. Um, but what I was going to get to also is the cognitive aspect that is affected. Many times they all, when they grow up maybe to be teenagers or adolescents, they don't want to socialize because of sensitivity. Um, Insensitivity or oversensitivity? No, this 
these things can affect sight, smell, touch, um, hair, and taste. My friend used to say, I know, like, go to a club or go out at night because the lights, they hurt. And just so bright and flashy, why we need such flashy lights? Or this, the, the music is way too loud. Like, I saw children go in therapy for um, listening, hearing, sensitivity which they many times would have to walk around with headphones on because the sound of the motor vehicles would affect them a lot. And many times that gets entangled up with communication. Many of these children don't, uh, well, it also depends on what level of the spectrum you're on. Um, many times they don't know, how, they can't communicate. Many of them don't speak. Many of them use a tablet or a, um, images. Again, therapy, it all individualistic. Every child needs a different type of method, and not every method works for everyone. Um, but even that can make things complicated, not being able to express yourself. And I mean, communication is basic human need, you know, to be able to express yourself, to be able to express if you're content or if you're discontent. Repetitive behaviors, <laughs> repetitive thoughts. It's, it has been also um, very mainstream media has led us to believe that they become obsessed with one particular thing. And it might not be as um, excessive as the media has led us to believe, but many times, yes, their thoughts are repetitive, like some behaviors. I worked with a child who used to like looking at the fan, ventilator spinning, and he, he would just move his hand to it. Like just, it helped him calm down. It helped him take out some energy. I worked with a little girl who used to like, um, just feeling her fingers like this repetitively and going, mm, and to them stimming is soothing, stimming is healthy, stimming is good. That's their coping mechanism for stress. And many people see this happening in our community and people are just judged for it. This is so weird, are you to do that? You could please stop making that noise. It is just we're, we many times don't realize that what works for us might not work for others, and what works for them might not work for us. But if it's helping them to release some energy and some stress, then why are we so concerned? You know? Uh, can we move on to the next one? So there are three levels of autism. Level one is requiring some type of support. Level two is requiring substantial support, and level three is requiring a lot of support. You need to realize that, well, many times we don't speak about high-functioning autism. People who can get on in their day-to-day -day life, people who have some characteristics but also are affected by normal society and don't really um, go diagnosed or aren't as bothered as children who are on the other end, let's say, can't leave their home, have a lot of other organic disorders. Um, and then we have something called, or was called Asperger's syndrome, which is a type of functioning autism. And many times also considered the genius level of autism, in which we don't realize that, um, Yes, they might remember many, many, many things. They might be experts in a certain topic or area, and but then like they go home and then confuse, push from pull, or a certain type of noise bothers them, or the lights are too bright for them. Things that we don't realize also affect them. And each type of, if we can move on, the Early detection and intervention really is best in, for autism 
the sooner you know, the better. And many times moms will tell you, I noticed something wasn't normal with my child. I even noticed something off. Like my first child wasn't like this, or my this is my first child, but I read so many books, or I've seen many babies, and this never seemed too okay for me, so I want to get a checkup. But many times they don't go for a, a diagnosis for atypical disorders. They go for more organic things, and so the child doesn't go diagnosed, or they're told, oh, you know, maybe they're just too young. Is the Shane will be able to tell us next. Early detection can be done and it is very important. And also an individualistic approach to intervention is very important because no two individuals with autism are alike. I open the floor for the Shane now. Okay, thank you. Um, before I talk about how a person is assessed and diagnosed for autism, I just wanna to touch on certain points as a reminder in terms of as we talk about autism, Sometimes it's a hard conversation to have because oftentimes we talk about autism and one image comes to mind. We have these, this ideal image of a child that is autistic. And like you rightfully said, you know one person who is autistic and you still don't know uh, what is autism. And a lot of the times conversation about autism, it's always in the language of the persons who are at level three, who needs a lot of support and are severe. Um, and that adds to why some people don't go for assessment, don't go for an evaluation, because they see their child functioning in certain areas. And because this doesn't fit the image that we have when we talk about autism, they don't go for testing. Or if someone say or suggests, you know what, you should probably get your child assessed, that person becomes defensive because again, the image that they have doesn't match the image that we have when we, when we think about autism. And a lot, a lot of that has to do with the language that has been used when we talk about autism. When we think about, when we talk about autism, it's often a white little boy because it, um, with severe behavioral issues that has no control, that's the image that people come to about. And so again, even parents wanting to, uh, is afraid to associate their child with that behavior because it's shunned upon. And, and so, the crowd goes wild. Yeah. Every special need parent right now in the crowd is that watching this is going, yes. Hallelujah. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, so that makes it even more difficult for parents to want to get their child assessed because that is the image that they have. I like that you said that there's different level and different characteristics. Now, when we talk about cognitive, it's not to talk about intellectual capabilities because a child could be autistic and have um, int their intelligence is really good. And because it's a spectrum in terms of social communication, that varies. But oftentimes we talk about social communication, we say the child can't do this, the child can't do that. Again, it, it varies from one person to the other and it, it isn't always eye contact. Like, you know, you Google autism and the first thing will say, well, the person doesn't give you eye contact. Some do right um in terms of sensory so we have we all have sensory organs and we all interpret the environment differently for some persons who are autistic they may be hypersensitive to certain in, um, environmental factors whether it is a more of a visual whether it's tactile whether it's their taste buds whether it's light so that varies and not all persons who are autistic have sensory um limitations as well there are some persons who are hypo so they don't get as stimulated um, from their environmental factors and some are in between and so for something and that's why sometimes they may have trouble with danger because what we classify as danger or warning signs because of their sensory um challenges they may not interpret the environment as being dangerous um, repetitive behavior, you said it well in terms of um, some of it is soothing. There are also some persons, their stimming may cause harm. So again, it's figuring out your particular child and understanding what are the behavior characteristics that your child have, because indeed each person child will be different, right? And so when we talk about autism as a spectrum, 
we want to focus on them, the two main areas where that person may have challenge with, and that that area is usual social social communication and repetitive um, behavior. Why do I say those two? Because there's also a separate diagnosis called social communication disorder. And again, there's still this, well, is it one of the same? Is it a variation? Um, even ADHD is sometimes questioned in terms of, is it a separate or is it part of autism? Just because there are some shared similarities. And that's why getting an assessment is very important. Um, the warning signs, again, it varies from person to person. And I think apart from warning signs, I think developmental screening should be something that we all do for our children because we just never know. Um, you said that in the UK, for every five boys that is assessed, one girl is assessed. And that's a, it's similar here in Belize. For every four, four boy that I assess, one of them is a girl. So I test more boys than girls. Again, because of the language and the description, parents will recognize boys a lot faster than girls because the language doesn't seem to describe girls um, as, as much as it describes a boy. Also, some of the things that girls do, they are much able to com camouflage a lot better than the boy. So a lot of the times the girls that I assess are often older, are about the age of eight. Um, before, you know, they, they have questions in terms of autism. Even older adults are coming in now for assessments. And again, I think one of the main reasons is because Autism Beliefs has been just sharing out information that now we have adults coming into a question like, hey, you know, this has been me um, a lot of the time and now they just want to get that confirmation. So I'm glad that we have for, we have um, platforms like this to be able to talk about autism because indeed it's not just the typical image that we have when we hear the word autism and that has been one of the hindrance to testing. And so that's what I want to get into now in terms of testing. So a child can be diagnosed as young as 16 to 18 months. Um, they, a developmental pediatrician, a pediatrician, uh, psychologists with specialized training are able to make diagnosis for a child for that young, right? Um, and they go through, there, there's a battery of assessment that they go through. So parents are oftentimes the best resources to get information because they see them on a regular basis. Any clinician that you work with only get a snapshot of your child for that time when you're in um, the, the, the testing room, the office, or wherever the child is being tested, we only get a snapshot. So a lot of it also has to do with the parents report. Now, culturally, we have it, we aren't a first um, culture that keep track all the time of our child development. I mean, <laughs> I work it from young children to very old, and part of my intake form is a developmental history. And some parents will be like, um, I'm not sure, I think in normal, like, so we don't really keep track, but those are also things that are very important for our diagnosis, right? Because again, we want to be able to differentiate what autism, um, we want to differentiate different disorders that the child may have to be able to be confirmed that this is autism indeed that we're seeing. So having developmental history is also very important. In terms of, um, so ch children ages 18 months to three years old are much easier to assess um, because of the, the amount of research that has been done within that age group. There are numerous screeners as well as diagnostic tools that give a higher probability that indeed this child is, uh, is autistic. And we use all the, the multiple tests plus the background information to make a decision in terms of, yes, this child meets the criteria for um, autism. You can go to the next slide, please. Okay. You can go the other way then. Okay, you can keep it there. You can keep it there. Yes, thank you. For children who are three years old and older, the test battery will look a lot more different. Why? Because when we look at how we diagnose a child and the characteristics, we're not only looking at social communication and repetitive behavior. 
we have to be able to decide we have to be able to see if this child has intellectual um disability limitations or not we have to be able to um talk about their sensory responses we also have to look at in terms of can it be described by, by another um diagnosis so that's why oftentimes it's comprehensive because we have to be able to rule out other diagnosis and that will also help us in terms of the type of support that the child needs so it changes as the child gets older because more is required to be able to rule out more is also required in terms of getting the support that parents need for their child so once they're under the age of three the support it's, it's easier to say okay these are the support that the child needs because developmentally they don't need as much as they get older the needs change and so we have to be able to account for different areas so whenever um, you're getting an, uh, an evaluation you want to make sure that you are getting a comprehensive evaluation because you don't want to just know that your child is autistic that's just the first part right you want to be able to understand the different areas and look at your child holistically whenever i give up before i give a parent any diagnosis i always ask them how would this diagnosis change your life what would be the next move for you what does this mean for you because having a diagnosis is one thing and yes that comes with its own process but it's also how do we change now how do we support this child based on the different limitations? But if you just have a diagnosis and know nothing else, and even if you reach out to get support, people won't know how to support you because they don't understand the different areas. And culturally, people get afraid when they hear autism. You know, um, a lot of times people decide not to send their child to school. They may consider Stella Maris. Stella Maris is a deaf school. It wasn't particularly created for persons who are, are autistic. But again, because of limited resources and people were shying away from um, allowing their child to be in mainstream school, sometimes children who are autistic may end up at Stella Maris. Um, and so the school that I know personally that supports autism is Horizon. Um, from inception, that is the one school that I could say they, they create a community base whereby, you know, they have a special ed teacher that they could pull out, you know, they have different support systems. And so, but then how would you know what, I'll, when you go to the school, what would you tell the school? My child is autistic, okay? What do your child need? <laughs> All right. So sometimes having that helps the school at least have a starting point, right? Because an, an assessment and evaluation is just a starting point. There are so many other factors that need to be considered after that um, assessment. And remember, like I said, an assessment is a snapshot of that child at that particular time. So that is not a long lived document that says for the rest of your life, this is your child functioning. Some child may be at a level two or a level three, and depending on the support, the resources that they have, they may fluctuate between different um, levels. And like you rightfully said, some children could be at level one, but depending on their environment, depending on changes, they may regress and go to a level two. And again, so it's that continuous assessment, all right, to, to be able to figure out what it is, it is that your child needs. So what does a comprehensive assessment look like? Like I said before, you want to have a comprehensive developmental history as well as a medical history you want to be able so we get information from parents from teachers from babysitters we also have standardized questionnaires that we ask to get more detailed information because if you've ever been to a doctor you'll know that you go there <laughs> you try to describe your experiences and then like some of them just can't pop up you can't remember all of the things that you were concerned about. And so sometimes they'll have a form for you to complete to be able to gauge some of the things that you're experiencing. They will also assess for their social communication interaction. That may be part of you. Get, we'll get also a report again from parents in terms of their behavior, their parents or anyone that interact. But we also do the activities with the child to be able to see how they respond to us as a stranger. Um, and we ask, 
for younger children, we have sometimes have the parents in and we say, is this a typical response, right? Because again, we want to be able to understand what is typical for that child or is it because of the environment? Some children, they don't want the door closed, so we have to be able to adapt. So we try to create an environment whereby we are assessing how the child functions. Like I tell parents, don't get embarrassed. Leave the child, let the child do whatever he or she wants to do. Because I want to see them as natural as possible without feeling that they, the child has to be presented in a particular way. Because that is important. So a lot of time there's rating scales because um, we want to get their particular behaviors that we're looking for. Um, and so the rating scales help us to get more detail apart from the interview that you have because we may miss something and we want to be able to still catch it in different areas. If the child is above the age of three, we also assess or screen for their intellectual functioning because a part of the diagnosis is you want to be able to state if, this, if, this, if, the, if the child is autistic with intellectual um, difficulties or without. And that is important, right? Because again, the resources, the support that you need will will vary based on all these information. Hence the reason it's important to get a comprehensive one. We also want to understand their adaptive functioning. Why? Because we want to know how they interact in their environment, what works, what doesn't work. And that will also give us in terms of, okay, um, suggestions. And their academic, if the child is in school, depending on the level, um, if you're thinking, so let's say your child is four, five, and you're trying to decide, well, should I send my child um, to this particular school? Well, you want to know what level the child is, what level of support. So um, that could help you in terms of, can the child function more independently at school? Will the child need more support? What are some of the accommodation or adjustments that the school will, will need? Sometimes they don't, sometimes they may need a lot. Um, Christy had shared in terms of, and I know she's going to explain a little bit lot, um, later, uh, having a shadow, right? So being able to understand the child in those different areas is really is a starting point. And like I said, an assessment is not a full stop for your child. It is a continuous. Continuum, um, yeah. Is a continuum and it, it progresses, uh, it changes. And each time you want to be able to check in. Now, in terms of, so that is what a comprehensive battery would look like and why it's important to, to get a comprehensive evaluation because for the diagnosis, you want to be able to talk about what type of support you want to be able to rule out other um, similarities. One, and one of the reasons I like to say that is a lot of the time parents think my child is autistic because, and they'll give you their reasons. But it could also be developmental delay disorder, which may have some of the same um, characteristics, right? So we want to be able to know for sure, is your child autistic? Or because some of the behavior are similar to a, to a child who has um, delayed developmental disorder. And usually those children will grow up and have intellectual disability. So again, the support, we want to be able to tell you um, that we have at least a 90 to 95 percent that yes indeed the various tests are consistent is a pattern and we're able to say okay this is the diagnosis for your child because that is important whatever diagnosis you get that that is a life changer so we want to make it as accurate as possible and not just be trained out a diagnosis um so it's important for someone to get um assessed So, um, yeah, importance of a comprehensive assessment. Oh, thank you. Oh, before, I'm sorry, before, <laughs> before, before um, I forget, I know a lot of the time some of the concern um, about an assessment, and especially I'm talking about a comprehensive assessment, is, is finances. Um, a lot of time that is also a hindrance in terms of persons getting assessed, right? Um, and so, like I said, if we start to do screeners earlier, that helps. But also, um, I, I could tell you that Counseling and Psychological Services, we work with parents. Um, 
we do payment plans if we have to. We want it. We want to make it accessible as possible. Um, it is expensive because the materials are expensive, um, and so our rates compared to the U.S. the other parts of the Caribbean are are cheap because we want to make it affordable for our per to, to parents. But we also understand that even though it's affordable, and I'm saying it's affordable because I know it, it's cheaper. I also understand that apart being a parent comes with a lot of responsibilities. You have bills, etc. So if you're watching and you're saying, "Well, I don't want to get my, I don't want to get an assessment because it's expensive," reach out and see how we go create a payment plan. Don't let finance be an hindrance. It's an investment, yes, but you'll have a better idea of how to support your child and get the proper resources that you need. So I just want to, I just want to like bullet point here to also remember that you can go out of the country to get an assessment done somewhere else. But if you have been living here all your life and your child was born here and all of your people ha are to the bone Belizean culture is very important. Someone who understands our culture and knows um, what is normal and believes, quote unquote, is very important when making any diagnosis with regards to mental health. And honestly, going outside the country, as Deshane mentioned, um, it's not going to necessarily be cheaper. It really won't. The, Deshane is right by saying that her prices are not that high when you're comparing it to what you would pay in. Florida or some of the other places around the world. It, there really are comparable prices. Um, getting an assessment done because it's not a medical test. It's not something you just do a blood test with or you run a scan or something like that. There is a lot of hours of observation and questions and everything. It really is complicated. Um, I feel for parents, I have a list of five new parents in the last 24 hours that have concerns. and. I understand they don't have that kind of money, get that. Um, so I feel for their problems, but I can see um, having been there, having done numerous assessments um, in various countries, I know how complicated it is and how much time and effort it takes for that person, for whether it's a developmental pediatrician or a clinical psychologist with specialty or a pediatric neurologist, whoever it is, there's a lot of detail and attention to the behaviors and everything that has to do. Um, so yes, the, the price is definitely comparable. Um, there's nowhere really that you can just go and get it done for free. Not, not a, you can get a screening that might be cheaper or a basic evaluation, but a full diagnostic test is just generally, it's expensive worldwide. Yep, I agree. Um, can we move on to Christy's slide now? Before I get into mine, I just want to say, Desheen, you are my hero. I love some of those points that you mentioned, um, just acknowledging and the fear and everything. I think you were on point with those. Um, I'm going to just put on a hat for Horizon because I help with their social media. Um, they are a inclusive school. So the majority of kids that go to Horizon are neurotypical with no problems, but because they are inclusive, they will accept kids who are on the spectrum, who may be blind, who may have Down syndrome or another learning disability. They have a setup with a special ed department and support staff and everything. So yes, um, they have been a godsend with my son because they are welcoming. Uh, it is easier for them if they have a full diagnostics to work, but every child that gets into Horizon, they'd have to do some form of an assessment or screening with the special ed teacher, whether they're neurotypical or not, um, as they deal with placement, because you can only put so many kids in a classroom with so many special needs or, or different um, abilities. Um, so I'm just gonna put that hat on, and now I'm gonna take it off and move on to me. Um, I was invited tonight to talk about the personal aspect of this as we there in a title. Um, I am an autism mom. I have been an autism mom for over a decade. Um, so I just, I want to point this out because Deshane mentioned it, you know, that everybody has that one image in their head, whether depending on your age group, it's Rain Man or the guy from the, the doctor that's on TV now or, 
or whatever, you see this one thing, the guy on the voice that's blind but gets a mic and he can sing and he's on the spectrum. So every child on the spectrum might sing. So I'm just here to sort of try and make it real. So I'm gonna just talk about a little bit about my journey because I, 15 years ago, was just an average person and I had no idea what autism was. I was working hard, uh, you know, went to college, racked up a whole lot of debt that I had to work to pay off to get my degree, um, partied hard because, you know, college student, young girl, um, fell in love, fell in love again, worked a little bit more, struggled with school bills, just like every other, you know, 20 something in this country trying to figure out what their life was. Um, if you had asked me autism, I would have been like, wah, how you spell that? Um, not anywhere on my radar. Can we move to the next slide there? I traveled, I joined Rotary, I had fun. Like I said, we fell in love, decided, planned after year, after getting married for years to have a child. Life was perfect, you know? I even planned my child. I was like, my husband's a Libra, I'm a Libra. I want a perfectly balanced and every way child. My mom had lots of sons already. I wanted a little girl. Got the ultrasound, oh my God, it was another boy. I planned, you know, I was like, I cut off, I'm like, if I get off my pill, December, the end of December, early January, I have a great chance of having a baby in, Jan in October, I'm gonna have my Libra. Got pregnant on schedule, child comes six weeks early, I have a Virgo. I should have known right then and there that this kid was just gonna like screw up every plot I had in life. But I had him and he was born what I thought was normal. He was a gorgeous child. I mean, because, you know, he belongs to me and I'm modest. Um, he developed normally. I have one of the cases of recessive um, autism. He was meeting milestones. He crawled at six months. He sat up because he was this fat kid. I put him on the desk and he just kind of up there. So he was sitting up at four months. Yeah. Um, I breastfed. I did what I had to do. I made his food. I didn't give him jarred food. I did what I was supposed to as a first time mom who had planned for years to have a child. Um, and like I said, he walked at nine months. He was climbing up the stairs at 10. He slept through the night. And somewhere around, I think it was December. So October, November, December 12, 13, 14, 15. At the 15 mark mark, he got his first ear infection. It was the first time he'd been sick. And after that, I had a series of problems with him. I started to see him lose language. He wasn't sleeping at night. I went from being able to take him out to an English pub on a Friday night and say, here, and have, you know, it'd be like midnight, who has my child? Because he was just the life of the party. He was very social to not being able to take him anywhere. And he didn't want anyone but mom. All of a sudden he was really clingy. He, you know, he wouldn't sleep. He was fussy. It was like, this wasn't my child. And like a bunch of other moms that started on this journey, I thought he was deaf. I thought the ear infection had messed him up. He'd lost his words. He had a whole bunch of words. He was playing, he was dancing to the wiggles. I have video proof that when the wiggles said turn around, my kid would turn around and raise his hand in the air. It was normal. And I started this process, uh, maybe because I was stressed out. I was like, why is it my child sleeping? What's going on with him? What's with the behaviors? And then somebody threw out the A word and in many of our cases, it's a bad word. It's a scary word. It's a word you don't want to hear. What the hell is autism? 13 years into this, I am still learning about what is autism. And that's what DeShane was talking about, but the complexity of it. You can get a basic screening. You can get a little evaluation, but a full diagnostic, which sometimes has like 100 page questionnaires, I know I filled them out. It's complicated. And all of a sudden, at 16 months, that's what they were using. And like most parents, you don't want to hear there's something different in your child. Actually, I'm not going to be PC right now. I'm going to be honest. I was thinking, I don't want to hear what's wrong with my child. Because at that point, I wasn't thinking he was different. I was thinking there's something wrong and I want to fix it. That's not correct. And I've learned from this. But at the point, that's where I was in life. I was thinking, what's wrong? We did EEGs, EKGs, sleep studies, MRIs, scans of his head. We've done 
chromosome tests, genetic tests, all. There's one point, and my child was, what, about 18 months, and they took like seven vials of blood for the amount of tests we were going to take. Um, I was researching, and I kind of knew it was autism. I, 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 I know it was going there. I knew it. In my gut, I knew it because I was learning. But I was still at the point where it's, how do I fix this? What's the cure? Spoiler alert, there's no cure. I think we mentioned it earlier. Um, so there's a whole learning journey with it. For a parent, accepting that there's something different because it's not that they're wrong with your child is one of the hardest things I have ever done. Scratch that, it's probably the hardest thing. When you were planning for this perfectly balanced child and you think he's not, he's gonna be prime minister of this country, he's gonna rule the world because my kid is gonna be that awesome. He's gonna be that amazing. And then you're dealing with this, it's, that's hard. That is, I mean, even with medical stuff, if your child has a tumor, a cancer, it's scary, it's horrible, you wanna pray for that, but you still think, well, we can have surgery, we can do this, we can do that. With autism, our emblem is the puzzle because we don't know what causes it and we still don't know what to do about it. Should we do anything about it? You know, I, and, and what do you do? Because some parents will tell you, oh, I did floor time therapy and it was amazing. Or, oh, my son met a horse and all of a sudden he started talking or he swam with dolphins. Again, took him for equine therapy, took him swimming with dolphins, which he did like was amazing, but yeah, I didn't get him talking. We've done floor time therapy. We've done play therapy. We've done excessive hours of different types of speech therapy because yes, there's more than one type of speech therapy. We've done ABA therapy. We've done occupational therapy. And when they tell you this thing, and my son was diagnosed level three, so they tell you he needs intensive therapy which according to the books is 30 to 40 hours a week. Well, average cost of therapy is about 75 to $100 an hour worldwide. You're in the States, put a USD on the bottom. You're in Australia, whatever, it's that's the cost. And we did intensive therapy with my son. We made small steps, which now learning and experience, I find out 80% of us families that's our thing. We make small steps and small increments. They're the few that manage to find this amazing thing and make a breakthrough. But for most of us, it's hard work. It's a lot of patience and determination. And you just have to keep trying because you're going to try something and it's not going to work. And that doesn't mean you have to give up. You have to just keep trying. And Estimates show that within the cost of what they break and, and how hard it is and medical stuff, plus the cost of all these therapies, if you're doing what you should be doing, you're paying for a Harvard education every single year. That's the cost of living with autism. And our host mentioned about, do we want a cure? And most people say no. And I can see the debate with it. I mean, they, the guy that created Pokemon, He's on the spectrum. If we took away his autism, would he have done that? Would Temple Graydon be who she was and have all these patents if she wasn't autistic? So I can see where there's a certain amount of pride, like there's pride with our Belizean culture about autism. But from the other end of the spectrum, looking at it from another glass, from a son who is level three and nonverbal and 13 and battles with anxiety, depression, sleep disorder, gastrointestinal problems, um, aggression, apraxia, feeding problems, because my son has all of those issues plus plus. Looking at that, I'm not saying I want a cure, but I'm not saying it's a blessing either. And I'm not talking because it makes my life hard. I'm talking it because his life is hard every day. Of all of us looking at this, people go, I don't know how you do it. I think that's one of those things you should never tell an autism mom. Because it's not about what I do. It's I don't know how he deal, deals with it. How does he live in our world where we don't understand? It? He's dealing with all of this sensory stuff. He has a problem communicating and, and doesn't have, you know, now he does with this iPad. But for a long time, he had no method of communication. How does he deal and still wake up with a smile on his face every day? 
my kid is freaking amazing. I don't care where he falls on the intellectual spectrum, whether he's a, he has average intelligence or below average intelligence. To me, he's 13 and still struggles to write his own name. But my child is amazing because he's battling a world when it almost is like he's from a different planet. And he's doing this and he does this with a smile 80% of the day. That's who's amazing. That's who the super person is. It's not about me. I cope by drinking blue margaritas on a Friday night. So can we go to the next slide there? So as a parent, a lot of people go, well, I see, I know someone who has a child and they won't accept it. Or why can't parents get their, ch their children help? And I completely see where you're coming from. And I absolutely stress the importance of early diagnosis and early intervention and getting help. Whether it's the A word or not, if you if your child has any sort of developmental delay, you can work with them. No matter what they're diagnosed or if there is no diagnosis. If your child is three and not meeting milestones for walking, talking, whatever, you work with them. If your child is 15 and struggling with math, you'll tutor them. You'll yourself or if you have the money, you'll hire a tutor, you'll get help. So if your child isn't developing, you work with them. So that is one thing. But going from understanding what it is, because even when you get the diagnosis, you kind of walk away and you go, what the hell is that A word? And I'm scared because I only know about Sheldon on TV. Um, so there's a lot to learn. And there's stages of acceptance. Like I said, when I went with it, I went from what's wrong with my son and how can I fix him? to, okay, he's autistic, but what do I need to do? And it's elusive and it's arduous. It's extremely hard. Um, I feel sometimes when they're smaller, you're thinking you can work with them, you can help, but you still somewhere in the back of your mind thinking, but when he's 18, he's gonna be okay, right? Or if I do this, it's gonna be all right. I talk to parents all the time who are attending our trainings and I still feel sometimes they're looking for that magic pill. They're looking for the medication or the one person who's going to do something. And I don't blame them. I search for years and years. And maybe they will find it. But true acceptance is looking at your child, loving them for who they are, and being willing to work with them to make sure you're trying to help them reach their fullest potential, wherever that potential may be. I just see a comment here saying Make, being a mom makes you want to learn about everything because you never know what your child can have. Absolutely. Like I said, I didn't know autism till autism walked up and punched me in the face and said, you better learn. And that's what it's about. And that's why we do this because we want to support our parents who maybe have gotten the diagnosis or a screening or an evaluation. Maybe it's just dealing with some developmental delays. But we want to tell you that we're here for you and that we're going to work with you and we're going to try and give you your tools to work with your child. Because the bottom line is, is we love them. No matter how much they stress us out and how much I want to scream, and there are many days I scream, I'd scream loud. I think my whole neighborhood, the mile around my house knows my son's name because they hear me screaming. It is what it is. But the goal is to just keep working with your kids. We can't keep give up. We can't lock them in their house and just keep them there. We can't just pull them out of school and say, we're going to do this. We've got to work with our children. We've got to love our children. And we've got to realize that wherever they may be, we're going to work to push them to their fullest potential. Can we go to the next slide? Autism is a journey I never planned. And this is this is a quote that's online. There's It's anonymous. I added the and sometimes cry, cry and scream about, but I sure do love my tour guide. And that's the bottom line. For us in my house, because it's different in every house, and I'm not here to judge what you do or you don't do. And I hope when you look at me, you don't look at me and judge too harshly either. Um, our journey has been hard. It has not been easy for him more than for me but the bottom line is he's got the most awesome smile and he looks at me and i love him to the ends of the world and that's why we keep doing what we do um 
I don't know if that helped. I only had a short period of time, but that's sort of what I have learned in 13 years is that no matter how much you feel or how much you get up to the bat and you keep striking out, is that you keep working at it because the goal is to help them reach fullest potential. My son's fullest potential might be just going paddle boarding and swimming every single day. But your kid's fullest potential, boy or girl, might be to be the next prime minister. And we've got to work to get them there. I think that's it on my slide. Awesome presentation, ladies. I, I feel like I've learned a lot. And Christy, I feel like I never want to stop hearing about your journey. Yours and Mateo's. Because it's, it's I, I can imagine. Can I just it's, start hearing about my journey? I am hoping that by next year, April, when all of these things come about, there are going to be so many of my parents and my parents' group that are going to be willing to stand up and talk about their journey. <laughs> Everybody's gonna is gonna get right if they're not tired yet. They're gonna be so tired of hearing about Mateo, and this isn't about Mateo. This is about everybody's child. So my goal is that by April 2022, when you want to do these, we're gonna have five, six, ten, fifteen more parents that are kind of gonna so. talk about their journey, their acceptance, which might be completely different than mine, but as a way to teach and learn. Right now, I'm the one that's a brave soul. We need a little tequila to get through this. But I'm the one doing it because I have no shame. But Someone the goal is to get it of other parents, and you're going to hear other stories. And then soon you're going to be, wait, wait, who's Mateo again? That's <laughs> cool. When people start seeing that, then I know we've done a good job. True, true. All right, let's see. Uh, we got a few questions. Um, let me see if I can, oh, there we go. So Maritza Molina is saying, I like fidget spinners that can be used to relax and release stress, right? If that's what your child likes, then yes. So again, you, it's going to be based on your particular child. So fidget spinners may not work for every, every child. So figuring out what they like, or even introducing it and see if that is something that would work for them. Like we said, no, there is no one, none, one strategy, one toy, one activity that's going to work. And so it's, it's always this search, you know, like Krista said, it's going to change here and there. Sometimes it's going to work. Yeah. It's going to work. It is not. Think about every, every normal person. You might sit down and twirl your hair when you're in a meeting, you chew on your pen. We do these as neurotypical, and they're not strange behaviors because everybody seems to, <laughs> right? Our kids fidgeting or stimming, which is a misnomer because it's self-stimulating and it calms them generally, um, are just different or they stand out because they're not what we consider normal. But the yeah. same way my son flaps is the same way someone might sit there and just twirl their hair in a meeting or chew on a pen. But it varies from person to person. As long, like um, Deshane said, as long as it's not um, damaging, as long as it doesn't hurt them or anyone else. I worked with a little girl who would hit herself. And she had bruises all on her side and on her legs. And that's the type of swimming that you don't really want to encourage because then it can also be aggression towards another person. And it's not very um, healthy for them. Fidget spinners are pretty, yeah. If it works, then awesome. Son would get mosquito bites, and they wouldn't bother him. He wouldn't scratch. But then when he noticed the bump, because it was different looking on his skin or, or like he, yeah, he's undersensitive to touch. So he'll bleed and not cry. And I only know he's hurt because I see blood around my house. He, you know, this is what he does. Will has a huge gash, wants me to take him for stitches, and there was no crying. It was just blood. And he was like, what? Because um, he's under sensitive to pain. But when he'd get a scratch, no problem. But when it starts to scab, he'd look at it, and it's different. And he'd dig, dig, dig until he bleeds again. Then it'd scam over, and then he'd dig, dig, dig. Yeah. So behaviors. These are things we work at because it's not that it's not normal. It's that. This is causing injuries, so we don't want to do that. Or sometimes it becomes kind of like um, 
like you said, like dig it, it becomes slightly like an obsession with just like, oh, let's get it on. I, I have a friend who's like super high functioning, went to college with me, had got like a prize at Mexico for one of the top grades in psychology in my class. And one of the things that he would do would be to peel the little sides of his skin. So he basically had no cuticles and they would bleed and he'd be like, it hurts so much, but also like, I can't stop it, have to keep doing it. So if fidget spinners were for you, then yeah, I'm glad because it is pretty, it doesn't harm them and it's pretty healthy to do. So let's move on. We have a few other, um, this one, how early can autism be detected? The Shane, do you wanna, I think you already mentioned it, but if you'd like to elaborate. 16 to 18 months. And I think we can move on to the next one pretty because it they kind of go together. So when should a mom be concerned or a dad or when should a caretaker be concerned about their child? What signs should they be looking out for? You want to monitor and see how your child responds to you and other caregivers in the home. That would look like for different people again. Um, but as a mom, you want to see what type of attachment is there. Um, also, you want to also monitor the, the typical developmental that we look at. So in terms of how do they indicate that they want something in terms of um, copying the behavior. So children are, are learning and soaking a lot from us, all right? So when we smile, how they respond to that? Are they responsive to us? How do they communicate? Again, because of the, depending on the age, the detection and the signs will look different because of what is expected at that developmental age. So what I like to tell people, you, you look at um, what are typical development and then that's, that is your basic guide, right? Um, so even before a pediatrician says something, you just monitor in terms of how the child is responding to their environment. Um, as they get older, there will be certain things in terms of delay. A lot of the times, um, children are detected early because they their developmental um, is, there's a lot of developmental delays, but that, that that's not to say that a child who does not have developmental delays doesn't have autism. And so the best thing is to always get your child screened. You know, I am a psychologist, but I have I have a 14 months baby and I still monitor and check for for how he's developing develop, um, developing because that is important. Like Krista said, her child was developing well for the first year and then he regressed so it's not a one-time check it's just monitoring and um going to the doctor and check you know my mom always said pediatrician will get rich with me because if there's something that i'm concerned about i go <laughs> so even as well in terms of if you're concerned reach out get get your child assessed look for how they communicate um how they respond to their environment, whether it's a hypo or hyper or hypo. So if they're not responding to their environment, that's also a concern. As they reach around age two, 16 to 18 months, when language starts to develop, speech, sorry, starts to develop because a child could have language and are, is able to communicate, but their speech may not be as developed. And that is different. And that's why speech therapists are called speech and language because speech doesn't always equate to language. It doesn't have to be a language barrier. Yeah, true, true, true. Um, we have another one here. Kelly wants to know, how do you cope with the eating habits? That's a <laughs> Um, no, the feeding, honestly, we just did a training on that. So if you are a mom that has a child with feeding issues, call me. I have a video of a over two hour training that we've recently done. A lot of us think that our children, we classify them as picky eaters. Well, we've since learned that there's a difference between picky eaters and problem feeders. 
A picky eater will have a limited diet, but they'll have maybe 30 or 40 different foods. If your child is one that only has 10 or 20 different foods, then there's a lot of things to look at. And with autism, it could be something with the mouth and sensory issues. It could be the smell, um, posture and muscle tone, the gastrointestinal, how are the bowel movements going? Where are they sitting? How is it going? Because some of our kids that are so visual, you change the texture or the idea of things. So some things to look at, one of the first things I would tell you is write a food diary. Even before you call me, write down everything you think he eats. Is it all the same color? Is it all the same sort of texture? These are warning signs. Um, and we have a lot of tips and steps on how we can get them to expand their diet. Uh, like I said, we did a preliminary training that was about over two hours uh, just in January on this. It is complicated. I had many parents that call me afterwards and go, oh my God, I'm the worst mom because I would say, sit there and eat it because if it's good enough for your brother and your sister, you can eat it too. And then she attended the training and realized, holy crap, there's a lot more going on. And yeah. all of us think if your child is hungry, they will eat. Not so. It really is so much more than that. So if your child is eating between seven or eight foods, he's a problem feeder and we need to work with him. And I will happily share with you the training so you can view it. And then after you've watched it, we can talk. Our training was done by a speech and language pathologist and an occupational therapist, of which we have none in Belize. But we did it as a pair because there's two, there's so many issues that it couldn't be just one specialist. We had to get the two in to do that. So I'd be happy to talk to you um, about that afterwards because, like I said, that's ours to talk about. And, and my also I'm sorry, um, it's, if it's a, a link to a video or so, we can also attach it to the... No, I, can't, I don't share our trainings publicly because I want the parents to feel comfortable to ask questions and share. So I share those, if I'm gonna share it after the fact for training, it's with another parent. We don't post okay. it publicly because we don't want parents not okay. to ask questions because they might be worried about if they're not out in the open or are willing to talk or whatever, we don't want it on YouTube or anything like that. So I would share those links privately. All of our, our Facebook lives like this, that's all on our website, but our parent trainings, those are private and they're for parents. We allow teachers in because they get credit for it, but those are, are kept like that so that parents are more comfortable to share and talk. So where can parents find both of you ladies or how can they reach out? Shane? <laughs> <laughs> I work at Counseling and Psychological Services and we're located at 2A South Park Street in front of Memorial Park in the city. Autism Belize, you can reach us on at autismbelize.org. There's a contact us button and a WhatsApp button. Click that and you'll talk to me directly from autismbelize.org. Or if you go to any of our social media, Autism Belize, Facebook, Instagram, whatever, and you can message, you will get me directly as well. And I'd be happy um, to help you guys out. But that will lead to our emails, our phone number, um, Facebook Messenger, and any of those are ways you can reach us. So basically, Autism Belize. I yeah, I found you, Christy, on the website. I was like, oh, there's a WhatsApp option. Just and click it. Yeah. Really That's what she she answered like instantly. <laughs> I was I was well, like I, I don't know if she wants to help. Answer pretty instantly, and I get parents like it'll be ten o'clock at night, and they're they're messaging, and and that's fine. April has been really bad because whereas I will get one or two parents a week normally, um, there have been some days in April there have been like five or six new parents that are contacting me. So I will be honest, I've fallen behind and I've not been as, um, been able to be as chatty and as helpful or as, as responsive as I usually am. Uh, but April is almost done and I think things will slow down and we can have two hour conversations sometimes with parents as we navigate through this complexity of autism. You guys can also find Deshane, um, I forgot the name, I'm sorry Deshane. Counseling and Psychological Services is also on uh, Facebook. I have found them on Facebook and 
You're not on Instagram yet, right? Yeah, she. Yes, I am on Instagram. Yes. Oh, okay. Also, see. I never know. <laughs> yeah, so I feel like we need to get her to do our tick, our dance uh, for autism. I agree. I this Shane, this is no, us officially about, challenging you. I was thinking about doing it today because I was dancing with a little girl today, yeah. and I was like, you know what? We should be. I should be recording this. <laughs> I'm just saying that there's still another week, <laughs> April, and I am waiting desperately to see counseling and psychological services. Do or dance for autism TikTok challenge. Just okay. saying. I'll have Jeremy. Me and Jeremy will do it next week. Great. Yay. <laughs> Yay. Okay. Awesome, ladies. Um, I'm not sure where our viewers are watching us from, but if you haven't also shown some love to our Heritage Education Network, please Facebook and Instagram page, please do so. Um, or we also do have a website, so you can find us at heritageeducationnetworkbelize.org. Um, so website, Facebook, and Instagram. All right. If we have no other questions, I guess let's give a few seconds to see if any shy parent out there would like to ask a question. And if not, well, thank you so much to Christy and Deshane. Deshane, I don't know if you agree with me, but I feel like Christy should have shared her margarita with us. Well, it, it's um, Friday. I do blue margaritas on Fridays in April because we're doing Light It Up Blue Bleed, right? <laughs> <laughs> so True. it would be an absolute shame if I wasn't drinking blue margaritas from Brain Freeze Bleed's Margarita Bar. Find them on Instagram. I'm not sure if Facebook too, but they're on Instagram. It yeah, looks so I, good. I need to try it too. Special needs parent that's a part of our group. You get discounts this month on the blue margaritas from the margarita bar. So and it's like get discounts. And the therapists. <laughs> and the advocates. <laughs> <Do> the advocates. <laughs> Friday guys. Come on now. <laughs> Thank you so much. I am really glad I have been waiting for this moment since first year of college. I am so glad we can have an open discussion on autism in Belize for Belize. I think it is still a, a taboo topic here. And I am so glad that we are getting to a place in which we can just say autism and talk about autism and not be so terrified of autism, you know? Um, thank you, Christy, for sharing the experiences that you have had and the shame for your professional input. I think the whole country of Belize has learned a lot today and we appreciate it all. You guys know you can reach out to Heritage Education if you need anything. And uh, well, with that, we will say good night and thank you to all our viewers. I hope you have a good night and I hope you all get some margaritas soon. I'm gonna go check what we have. <laughs> I don't know if you're not a drinker. The ice cream shop has an excellent shades of blue ice cream. You really should go try it. It's actually a little like sugar too. And a dollar for every scoop that is sold at the ice cream shop during April of the shades of blue ice cream will come to all of our awareness activities for autism. Perfect. Belief. We'll check out the ice cream shop and their shades of blue ice cream. Thank you guys. All right. An option for everyone. Thank you so much, you guys. Have a good night. Bye. Bye.